Good morning everyone. I am Dr. Sarita Narayan, Professor and Head of Department of Periodontics, so to Periodontal Pocket. So just to give you an introduction, you all know what is a gingival sulcus, right? A gingival sulcus extends from the crest of the marginal gingiva to the base of the sulcus and it surrounds the tooth and it is bound by the marginal gingiva on one side and the tooth surface on the other side. So our entire discussion for today is going to revolve around this tiny 2 millimeter space. What happens to it when there is disease? How do you recognize that this area is diseased? And how do you treat it? So what is the definition of a periodontal pocket? It is a pathologically deepened gingival sulcus, right? So once again, to impress upon you, the gingival sulcus is a dynamic space, which means that you have the crest of the gingiva that can move in the coronal direction and you have the base of the sulcus that can move in the apical direction, which means for this pocket to deepen, it can move from both sides. It is not that one part is fixed and one end is dynamic and you measure from one fixed point. If you remember, this is what you do when you measure loss of attachment, which is always measured from one fixed point, which is the cemento enamel junction, apically. So this is just a simple clinical picture of what it looks like when you insert a probe in a periodontal pocket. You can see that if you assume this is a Williams probe, it's gone down almost 10 to 12 millimeters. Two words to remember here is deepening and pathology. Right? You have to have these two words in. It is a deepened gingival sulcus and it is due to pathology. So when you are writing any scientific literature, you have to always remember that there cannot be any prose. So prose as in P-R-O-S-E. Right? So the more you limit your description, the more you manage your time. And it's very important to have the keywords into all the answers or literature that you write. So what is the normal depth of the gingival sulcus when it is con when is it considered healthy? So ideal depth is 1.08 mm of the gingival sulcus but a clinically healthy acceptable depth is between 1 and 3 mm. So it's a range. It cannot be a fixed number for every patient. We all know that. Which means that anything that is more than 3 millimeters is now called a pocket if this increases due to pathology. So the basic first classification of pocket is whether it is a gingival pocket or it is a periodontal pocket or it is a combined pocket. So coming back to the point that I made with the previous slide, you have to remember that both ends of the pocket are dynamic, right? So you can either have this moving up coronally when there is a gingival enlargement, in which case you will have an increase in sulcus depth of more than 3 millimeters, right? Sulcus depth is measured from tip of the gingival sulcus to the base of the gingival sulcus. So when this becomes more than 3 millimeters, this is known as a gingival pocket, which means as you can see in this image, no part of the periodontal ligament is involved. This pocket is, all, is created only due to a gingival enlargement and hence it is called a gingival pocket and hence it is also called a false pocket. You have a second situation where you have the base of the sulcus moving down apically but your crest of the gingiva is steady. Once again this causes a depth of more than 3 millimeters and you can also observe here that there is the disease has now spread into the periodontal ligament. You can see some amount of bone is lost. You can see some amount of the root surface is exposed. And you can see that the plaque has now started moving on the root surface. So now we have entered into the zone of the periodontal ligament. And now this, this particular situation can be diagnosed as a periodontitis. This situation, situation A can only be diagnosed as gingivitis. Situation B can be diagnosed as periodontitis and then you come to the third situation right where you can have a combination of A and B where you can have an increase in the size of the gingiva as well as an apical shift of the 
junction epithelium or the base of the pocket and that now causes a combined pocket which once again is classified as periodontitis all right so having understood that is whether the relationship of the pocket with the alveolar bone or rather more specifically the relationship of the base of the sulcus with the alveolar bone right so as long as the base of the sulcus is above the crest of the alveolar bone it is known as a supra bony pocket if the base of the sulcus starts moving below the crest of the alveolar bone then it is called a infra bony pocket now the question that would come to my mind is why does this happen why is it that sometimes the base of the pocket is above the bone and sometimes the base of the pocket is below the bone so let's understand the context behind this you all will all be learning mechanisms of bone loss um, in the next class probably so there what you will learn is that you need a certain thickness of bone so there is th so okay let me start with the concept of radius of action okay the concept of radius of action says that if you have a bacterial plaque sitting on the root surface say a bacteria sitting on the root surface the bacteria has an ability to cause destruction only around a 2.5 km radius around itself right that is why even though you have a bacteria sitting on your tooth surface your finger doesn't get swollen up right because the bacteria does not have the ability to cause disease beyond 2.5 mm radius so which means if this bacteria has to destroy bone partially as you see here the thickness of this bone has to be more than 2.5 mm right if it is more than 2.5 mm then you will have infra bony pockets so typically in deep pockets as the root becomes convergent the interdental septum becomes wider right and in ma mainly or even the buccal and the lingual bone becomes a lot wider as the tooth root converges so the deeper the pocket the more likely you are to have a infra bony pocket now this type of bone loss is also called as angular bone loss and this type of bone loss is known as horizontal bone loss so a supra bony pocket to repeat and reinforce a supra bony pocket is where the base of the pocket is above the crest of the alveolar bone and there is horizontal bone loss whereas in infra bony pocket the base of the pocket is below the crest of the alveolar bone and hence it is it causes an angular or a vertical bone loss so one explanation for for this you have understood is due to the concept of the radius of action of the plaque there are a few more concepts like traumatic occlusion can cause angular bone loss so you will learn that in the subsequent chapters right so with this in mind we'll be. so if you push put your probe in at any point this probe will move this probe will move along the circumference of the tooth on two surfaces maybe even three right so this is known as a compound pocket again remember you're classifying the pocket the pocket is involving two or more surfaces if the pocket involves one surface it is a simple pocket right if the pocket involves two or more surfaces it is a compound pocket but this pocket is probable from each surface that it involves right then you have a third situation which is known as a complex pocket so if you see image 3 you can see the dotted line again it's a three dimensional image so you're seeing a proximal and the buccal surface you can see the pocket is starting on the proximal surface and it is turning through the bone onto the buccal surface so it is like tunneling through the bone right now this pocket is also involving two surfaces it is involving the proximal surface as well as the buccal surface if you put your probe into this pocket on the proximal surface you will be able to probe it but if you put it on the buccal you will not be able to probe it right so this is known as a complex pocket where a pocket starts on one surface ends on another surface and here it is involving two surfaces but this pocket can further tunnel and go around the tooth and involve the other proximal surface also so it can involve either one or more surfaces where it can be probed only from one surface and the bottom of the pocket is on another surface all right so to add another concept to this so that you all don't get confused in all these three situations you have seen that you are classifying the pocket 
right? So a simple pocket is a pocket that involves one surface of the tooth. A compound pocket is a pocket that involves two surfaces of the tooth where it can be probable from both the surfaces and a complex pocket is one that involves three surfaces of the tooth where it can be probed only from one surface, right? So typically your periodontal probe which is a very rigid metallic instrument may not be the ideal instrument to use for diagnosing a complex pocket. You may need something that is rigid but at the same time pliable, right? So perhaps a gutta percha point would serve the purpose for you to diagnose a complex pocket. So you can pass a gutta percha point through the pocket opening and if you find that it turns around the tooth, you can also shoot a radiograph after this and if you see the, pro the point turning around the tooth, your diagnosis becomes obvious, all right? So now you know that this tooth has four surfaces. So you can have two simple pockets on one tooth, right? So where you have one simple pocket on a buckle and one simple pocket on a proximal, okay? So this is where the confusion happens because you all feel that two surfaces of this tooth are involved, so it becomes a compound pocket. No, you are not classifying the tooth, remember that. You are classifying the pocket. So you have to only see how many surfaces of the tooth one pocket involves. I hope you've understood. We can always discuss this in person in class if there are any doubts. Classification so far. The first one is the gingival pocket, the periodontal pocket and the combined pocket based on whether the attachment is lost or not. The second is based on the relationship of the base of the pocket to the bone, supraboni pocket and intraboni pocket. The third is based on how many surfaces of the tooth are involved by the pocket, simple compound complex. Now the next one is based on the disease activity. Right? So you have two types of pockets, an active pocket and an inactive pocket. Now in both these pictures you can see that the probe is entering the gingival sulcus almost by about 7-8 millimeters. Right? But in the first picture you can see that there are signs of inflammation on the gingiva you can see that the gingiva is slightly dark pink, almost bluish pink. It looks inflamed, the surface is shiny, there is bleeding. So it's, a, it's active means an area where the bacteria have won over the host response, right? So the activity of the bacteria is causing an inflammation, is inciting an inflammation in the body and you have all, all signs of inflammation seen over there. It also means that the bacteria are multiplying it also means that the bacteria are destroying the tissue and it is an active lesion, right? In the second situation, you can see the probe has still gone in, right? So according to the definition of the pocket, the pocket is present here. But there are absolutely no signs of clinical inflammation. You can see the gingiva is coral pink. You can see a knife edge. There is no bleeding. There is no swelling, nothing. So this is known as a passive pocket classification which is on similar lines you have a edematous pocket and a fiberotic pocket right so this is based only on the nature of the pocket wall when the pocket wall is edematous and soft it is known as a edematous pocket when the pocket wall is firm and fibrous it is known as a fibrotic pocket wall you need to know about this because it will decide your treatment planning right so just to give you a context once again Edema settles down once you remove the local deposits, right? So in the case of an edematous pocket, once you remove the local deposits, that is the plaque and the calculus, the edema will settle down and the pocket wall will become firm and fibrous. But in case of fibrotic pocket, the enlargement of the pocket wall will not go away just by removing the local deposits. So you will need to do an additional, perhaps a surgical procedure to trim the gingiva down to its healthy size. Okay. So I'm just giving you these clinical tips so that the theoretical concepts are easier for you to remember. Every time you see a edematous pocket in your patient's mouth, I hope you remember that what what could be the treatment for this pocket so you just need to think you have to every time you uh, work in the department on patients you need to apply your theoretical concepts constantly every time you see any clinical situation 
it's a visual memory for you. Now going to the clinical signs. Now we all know signs are things that we see and symptoms are what the patient feels, right? So what are the clinical signs of pocket? We'll just run through this. It's a bluish red thickening of the gingival margin. Why bluish? Because it's a chronic inflammation, right? So in any chronic inflammation, you have a lot of cyanotic blood collecting in that area. And that's why you get a bluish hue, right? Uh, typically, this hue extends till the depth of the pocket. Of course, you have bleeding on probing, the classical sign of gingivitis and periodontitis. Sometimes you may have suppuration. Sometimes you may have tooth mobility, depending on how much of bone this pocket has eaten up. And sometimes you may have a pathologic migration and diastema formation because of the movement of the tooth. Now, all of these signs you are going to learn about in the chapters forward. So, I will not get into the details of the pathogenesis of mobility and diastema formation, etc. You learn about it. What you need to uh, do, the, the uh, thing that you need to learn here is suppuration, right? Now, here I would like to differentiate between an abscess and suppuration, right? So, suppuration is merely the formation of pus in an area. An abscess is a localized accumulation of pus in an area, right? So, you can see in this picture, right? You can see the uh, clinician's finger and you can see this little bit of pus that is oozing out of the pocket. Now, this happens when you, in, mostly in case of extremely deep pockets, complex pockets that we learnt about, right? Where the deeper the pocket is, the more anaerobic the environment becomes and you have a lot of anaerobic putative organisms acting up here. And they change the nature of the serous inflammation into a suppurative inflammation. And that's how pus is produced, right? So to be able to detect this pus, you have to give digital pressure from the base of the pocket, moving it upwards towards the marginal gingiva. And that is what pushes the pus out, right? If you just press at the marginal gingiva, you will not be able to see the pus because it will push the pus deeper. So you have to remember if you have an 8 millimeter pocket, you have to go till the base of that pocket and push or give digital pressure on the pocket wall and you will be able to show the formation of pus. Okay. So a tip here, instead of, che instead of checking all the 32 teeth, you can only check teeth where the pockets are deeper than 4-5 mm and where the pockets are complex in nature, right? Those are the areas where you would most likely find pus. Also, when you are checking your probing depths, when you pull your probe out, always observe the probe. If there is pus present, the pus will be stuck to the tip of the probe, right? So, this makes it easy for you. Always observe when you are probing. With one single probe that you put in, you can check bleeding on probing, you can check the pocket depth, you can establish the presence of the pocket in the first place. You can detect whether pus is present. So you don't have to waste your chair time and go back to check the same thing over and over again. In one single insertion of the probe, you can check four to five clinical findings. When we come to furcation involvements, I will teach you how to check furcation involvements also just by the single insertion of the probe fields, right? So as doctors, very often when the patient walks into the clinic looking at his face and body language itself we can make out how intense is the problem that the patient is facing right so just by him describing the nature of pain you can already you already have a differential diagnosis in mind right out of the 100 diseases that you've learned about it could be one two or three so learn, learn to understand these symptoms, learn to remember them and learn to apply them into the clinical situations. So with a pocket, you get very, very typical symptoms. So patient feels that there's a foul taste in the mouth because of this pus being oozing out sometimes. They feel an itchiness in the gum. They feel like sucking, you know, into the gums and then they get relief when they do that or they get relief when they stick a toothpick into the gum. So what this does is if there is some amount of exudation or even edema, edematous fluid in a serious inflammation, it's creating a little bit of pressure there in that pocket, right? So when you put a, uh, a probe in or you put a, a, 
uh, toothpick in or you know the this fluid is released and the pressure is released mm. and the patient feels a sense of relief also you find radiating pain in case of a pocket which radiates deeper into the bone so here you have to be able to differentiate between pulpal pain and periodontal pain pulpal pain typically radiates to the scalp right so and patient comes holding his jaw in his hand the pain is so severe he tells you i have not slept the whole night i've taken three painkillers i've still not been able to sleep you know immediately that that is pulpal pain but periodontal pain the patient will say yeah i have pain sometimes you know it's like it's dull i just feel that there's pain so these are your symptoms for pockets we'll move to the next stuck between the teeth and sensitivity to hot and cold so now that you've understood what is the definition of pocket you've understood how to classify pockets and you've understood how to diagnose a pocket based on the signs and symptoms we will move to what actually happens at the level of the tissues right what is the pathogenesis so what happens when you have a bacterial ch challenge in the form of plaque accumulating there is an inflammatory reaction that starts off in the diseased gingiva which causes an increase in the number of inflammatory exudate and inflammatory cells which now start destroying so they are trying to destroy the bacteria but there is always collateral damage you know that right most of the inflammation that you see in the body is because of collateral damage and this the so these also start destroying the surrounding gingival fibers and connective tissues now just apical to the junction epithelium this area is occupied by the gingival fibers the dento gingival fibers the transeptal fibers etc and this area is now invaded by the inflammatory the story now the collagen loss so these are the two steps that you have to write in your theory answers right if you are asked on pathogenesis these are very important points how does the actual destruction of the collagen happen so collagenases are enzymes that are secreted by various healthy cells in the body right fibroblasts polymorphonuclear cells macrophages and these destroy the collagen fiber they, they basically degrade the collagen fibers into smaller peptides right also the fibroblasts themselves are able to phagocytose the collagen fibers and destroy them so these are the two mechanisms of destroying collagen one is the phagocytosis by the fibroblasts and second is an enzymatic destruction uh, and these enzymes are released by bacteria as well as the host cells in point that's why i put a separate slide for that so let's continue the story what happens now due to this inflammation the number of neutrophils increase in the uh, marginal gingiva also because of the chemotaxis that's happening you all all know what is chemotaxis is the movement of the immune inflammatory cells and immune cells towards the antigens <coughs> so due to this all the all your uh, immune and inflammatory cells start moving towards the plaque which is sitting on the tooth surface right so huge amounts of cells now start moving towards the epithelial barrier and they are going to break this epithelial barrier there is ulceration of the epithelial barrier and they are going to go and attack the bacteria that are sitting on the root surface so due to this as a consequence of the collagen loss the apical cells of the epithelium also so there was collagen here so there was no real place for the epithelium to migrate but now that the collagen is lost the epithelium also starts migrating along the root surface in the form of finger like projections right so the point here that you have to remember is that this pocket formation is a process of live cells okay so for example in a in a disease like anag which is a necrotic disease right you cannot have a pocket formation because the gingiva just gets necrosed and destroyed but you will have a pocket in case of a chronic periodontitis or an aggressive periodontitis where the cells are alive and the cells are able to migrate to a more apical position in the process causing a loss of attachment and a deepening of the pocket right so at the same time now the pmns are invading the coronal end of the junction epithelium in huge numbers and the pmn are each other by attachment plaques known as desmosomes they are also joined to the tooth surface by hemidesmosomes so what happens what is assumed is when the relative volume of the pmns reaches approximately 60% or more of the junction epithelial cells the junction epithelial cells lose their cohesiveness and they detach from the root surface they also lose their attachment with each other and they start breaking apart 
So when this coronal portion of the junctional epithelium detaches from the root and the apical portion migrates, thus resulting in the apical shift of the epithelium. So the more the, deg the uh, degree of leukocyte infiltration of the junctional epithelium, the more the deeper is the pocket. Right? And this is independent of the volume of inflamed tissue. So if you remember, we, we saw two pictures of an active pocket and an inactive pocket. Right? So this is what happens in an inactive pocket. Even though there are no signs of inflammation, you could still have a huge infiltration of leukocytes and you could have a deepening of the pocket. Right? This is a vicious cycle. So how will you break this cycle? if you remove the plaque bacteria from that area. So the minute you remove the plaque bacteria from the area, there are no more neutrophils moving towards the plaque bacteria, there is no more inflammation in the gingiva and now you have a healing that sets off over there. Right? So we are going to learn very briefly about how to, uh, what are the treatment options for these pockets. I have mentioned this to you right now just to help you understand the context of practical application of pathologic principles. Important points, so let's talk exam. The important points here, pathogenesis of periodontal pocket is a very common question asked in your exam. So you have to mention, like I said, about destruction of collagen. You have The second event that you have to know is about how the junctional epithelium migrates down the route. So these three steps you have to mention about the neutrophils crossing the epithelial barrier, how that happens, how the epithelial cells lose their cohesiveness, the space created by the loss of collagen fibers, how the junctional epithelium starts moving apically into that space. Okay, so if you have a lot of inflammation in the pocket wall, then the gingiva also moves coronally. And you have, as you remember, what we learned was a combined pocket where you have an en enlargement of the gingival uh, wall of the pocket along with the apical migration of the junctional epithelium. All right. So that's about pathogenesis. I have just put a flowchart in my slide so that it's easy for you to remember. If you can just write all the events, wonderful. If you can't, at least write the important events, right? It happens on the, in the soft tissue, right? Now we are, we are going to start talking about what happens on the root surface. So we'll just run through the histo histopathology. Epithelium, that is a lateral wall of the pocket. These are the points that you need to write about the leukocytes infiltrating, the cells undergoing degeneration and rupture and ulceration and suppuration. Junctional epithelium, you have to mention about the movement of the cells and connective tissue. You have to mention about the inflammatory changes and the change in cellular events like polymorphonuclear cells being the first response, then the plasma cells infiltrating the area. So both the inflammatory cells and the immune cells inflammating, uh, entering the area. This is how it looks on a slide. So all these pictures are from Karanza. So you can just go back home and refer to these pictures once again on your own and understand. So what is the correlation between the clinical and histological features? The bluish red discoloration as I told you, smooth shiny surface. All this is caused by circulatory stagnation, destruction of the gingival fibers and pitting on pressure is caused by edema and degeneration. Less frequently, the wall may be pink. In such cases, fibrotic changes predominate over exudative changes, particularly with the outer pocket wall. Right? Then we go to bleeding. Bleeding is elicited because of the thinning and degeneration of the epithelium, the blood vessels now being more closer to the outer surface. Because of the destruction of the collagen, it is easier to access the blood vessels. The vessel walls are also fragile. You have polymorphonuclear cells moving out of the vessel walls. So everything is causing an oozing of blood. Pocket is painful because of the ulceration of the inner aspect of the pocket, which again causes easy access to the nerves. Pus present because of a mere change in the inflammatory process, serious inflammation to a suppurative inflammation. So now pocket content sometimes comes as a two mark question. So you just need to put all the three points in. It's mainly dead cells, dead microorganisms, products of microorganisms, food remnants, salivary mucin, gingival fluid, epithelial cells, also plaque and calculus. 
yes now we come to the root surface wall so we've been talking only about the soft tissue so far right but you also have the tooth surface which is present in this infected environment so what happens to the tooth surface as the junction epithelium moves down the root and now the cementum is exposed so you have many changes that you see in the cementum mainly remineralization and demineralization of the cemental surface many times causing areas of necrotic cementum causing root decay also destruction of sharpies fibers you know sharpies fibers are the ends of the periodontal ligament fibers and the gingival fibers which are entering the root surface right so these get destroyed and many times granules present on the root surface then you have of course cytotoxic changes that is you have bacteria entering into the dentinal tubules and sitting there there are endotoxins entering into the gingival tubules and sitting there and several other changes so that is why part of your treatment protocol for pockets is not just removal of the deposits but also treating the root surface right so not just removing the plaque and calculus from the root surface but also planing the root surface right you all have learned this in principles of instrumentation in in the third year itself so planing the root surface means removing all these soft deposits that are present on the root surface which are caused by these uh, inflammatory cells and bacteria and also to some extent removing the bacterial endotoxins that have accumulated on this diseased root surface right so even if you just do a scaling and polishing and leave the area alone as long as there are bacteria and endotoxins sitting on the root surface it is not going to allow the tissue to heal and settle down on the root surface right site specificity so periodontal destruction is very unique in the sense that sometimes you will find even on one tooth the pocket is present only on one surface so say only the buccal surface of a first molar is involved but the mesial and distal surface is absolutely healthy right so this is known as site specificity that there are only some sites that may be involved and it is not necessary that all the sites in what are the palpal changes that are associated with pockets so sometimes if you have pockets in regions where there are lateral or accessory canals right so you know that there are lateral and accessory canals in the furcation areas and in the apical third of the root so if you have your pocket extending into the furcation or extending into the apical third of the root then sometimes the bacterial pocket content uh, the pocket contents like the bacteria endotoxins enter through this lateral canals and accessory canals into the pulp and cause changes in the pulp in terms of pulpitis inflammatory changes or sometimes even atrophic changes so what is the relationship between attachment loss and bone loss to pocket depth the golden question that is asked in viva so these are your viva questions what are effects of pockets on pulp what are pocket contents what are what and, and the few further slides that we will see so attachment loss is always measured from the cej to the base of the sulcus attachment is the attachment of the junction epithelium at the cemento enamel junction in health so if this attachment moves apically it is known as loss of attachment a pocket is always measured from the crest of the gingiva to the base of the sulcus right so now here there are two examples of a pocket and of no pocket but attachment loss right so this is a pocket with attachment loss and this is a recession where you have already learned what is recession it is the apical migration of the marginal gingiva with exposure of the root surface so here you don't have a pocket but you still have loss of attachment okay the next slide so level of attachment versus pocket depth right so just to give you a simple example to understand this in this image the cal is 6 mm from the cej to the base of the sulcus and the depth of the sulcus from the crest of the gingiva to the base of the sulcus is 3 mm so this is the probable depth of the sulcus or the pocket in this picture again you can see that there is a pocket which is the pocket depth basically is more than the clinical attachment loss right because you have some amount of increase in the size of the pocket so this is like a combined pocket so here your pocket depth is more than the loss of attachment then you have a situation where you have all three in this you have a pocket 
which is 5 mm deep then you have recession which is around 2 mm and you have obviously loss of attachment so loss of attachment always measured from a fixed point that is cemento enamel junction to the base of the sulcus recession always measured from a fixed point that is the cemento enamel junction to the base of the sulcus next slide that is yeah so i have already spoken about this so here the only thing that you need to remember is that the distance between the apical extent of the calculus and the alveolar crest is almost always constant right and the distance from attached plaque to bone is never less than 0.5 mm and never more than 2.75 mm. If you remember, this is parallel to the radius of action concept that I spoke to you about, right? So, these findings suggest that the bone resorbing activity induced by bacteria is only exerted within these distances. So, how do you detect a pocket? By probing, if the probing depth is more than 3 mm and on a radiograph you can see how the bone loss looks on the radiograph if there was you can see the level of bone is higher here and the level of bone is lower here you can also appreciate this is an angular bone loss right where the crest of the bone is above the base of the or coronal to the base of the pocket probing technique the probe is always held parallel to the long axis of the tooth so that you don't land up measuring pocket depth from buccal to lingual you always measure from coronal to apical and it is walked circumferentially around each tooth surface to dia of deepest penetration okay. bleeding on probing i think we've spoken about this actually during uh, gingivitis how do you probe around implants you can use a light force of 0.25 newtons without damaging the peri implant mucosal seal ideally you should use a plastic probe and not use a probe right so the same points reinforce n so now we go to therapy so your basic pocket therapy now your focus on treating a pocket is essentially removing local deposits right so you have to remove like i told you to break this vicious cycle you have to remove the plaque and the calculus number one your objective is removal of local deposits Number two, treating the root surface and the soft tissue that is deceased by means of a curettage and root planing. And number three is transforming that area now into a healthy area which can be maintained by the patient. Right. So the various options available for you are either surgical or non-surgical treatment and you can also use lasers and your therapy. Right. So, surgery is done in case of pockets that are deep, right, or pockets that are more posterior in the mouth, on posterior teeth. It is only to improve your access to remove the plaque and calculus, right. So, with supra and subgingival scaling, you can access plaque and calculus up to 3 to 4 mm, 5 mm maybe in the anterior teeth, not more than that. Anything deeper than that, you have to open the gingival pocket and do a surgical therapy. Surgical therapy also helps you to change the nature of the soft tissues to bring them back to healthy maintainable soft tissue. For example, if you have a combined pocket where your gingiva is enlarged, then you will need to trim that excess enlargement and that can also be done with. So what happens once you treat a pocket, what is it that you achieve, right? So one thing you have to remember is that the bone never grows back with your therapy right so it's like if you for example the simplest example is if you cut your finger if you cut the upper one third of your finger it's out so when it heals your finger is not going to grow back right unless the surgeon takes that part sutures into that area only then you can have a regenerated finger right otherwise your finger will only heal by repair and that part of the finger will be missing forever so that's exactly what happens in this environment the pocket heals, right? So what do you mean by the pocket heals? The inflammatory component completely settles down, the breakdown stops, the bacterial activity stops, and this is what it looks like. So now you have no signs of inflammation, you don't have any activity here, the pocket is not progressing anymore, but the level of bone remains where it is, right? The collateral damage is that the pocket, when it heals, it causes the recession, right? So 
this is an active pocket just to show you the pictures this is a healed pocket which where the gingival enlargement has subsided and it has caused a recession this is an inactive pocket this pocket has healed but the pocket wall has not receded so you have now a, a, a pocket wall or or rather a healthy sulcus which is perhaps more than your acceptable 1 to 3 mm but there is no further activity of disease there is no destruction there are no clinical signs of inflammation and what happens with the root surfaces that these junctional epithelial cells now migrate down the root surface till the level of the fibers and they form what is known as a long junctional epithelium okay so this is known as a long junctional epithelium healing and if you try to push your probe into this your probe, probe probably may not go in if you push it very hard more than more than the pressure that you are allowed you may be able to separate the epithelial cells from the uh, root surface because they are held by a very weak bond of hemidesmosomes but if not then this healing can sustain for long periods of time so long as the patient maintains good oral hygiene right so for treating a pocket it is not just enough to remove the local deposits at one sitting but it is always a triangle so the tip of the triangle is what you do in your office where you treat the active lesion you remove the bacteria you remove the plaque you make the tissues maintainable the other two ends of the triangle are a home maintenance that a patient does on a daily basis morning and evening follows the instructions that you give him and the other end of the triangle is a professional maintenance right so once you have a situation like this it's very difficult for a patient to maintain this so he tries very hard but he needs a professional backup cleaning appointment on a regular basis right now this is regeneration so you will learn about this when once we start doing uh, chapters on treatment and you will learn that you can also regenerate the bone in certain situations and you can bring it back to at least 80 or 90% if not 100% right so these are all the possibilities that you can have uh, um, after healing of a pocket either you can have recession or you can have a long junctional epithelium or you can have regeneration so these two are repair and this is regeneration include and summarize so pocket formation is the first step in the periodontal breakdown cascade microbial etiology of the pocket is well established so in the future we are looking at just taking a a, a little sample from the uh, sulcus and we will know whether is this area going to develop a pocket or not microbial host microbial interaction is is what he, what causes the pocket formation and understanding the etiopathogenesis is essential to for success right so to summarize you have learned how to answer the theory and viva questions in this lecture you have learned how to diagnose based on the various signs and symptoms clinical signs as well as radiographic signs you have learned how to classify disease five classifications true pseudo simple compound complex based on the number of tooth surfaces involved supra bony infra bony bit depending on the relationship of the base of the pocket to the crest of the alveolar bone edematous and fibrous based on the nature of the pocket wall and active and inactive based on the activity of the bacteria you have also learned how to plan treatment for these patients and what is the healing that you can expect after your treatment common questions that are asked in your theory paper is one of the most important questions is a 10 mark question where they ask you to define so the definition carries two marks as you remember the keywords here are deepening and pathology right pathological deepening classify pockets like we summarized five classifications if you can draw diagrams excellent pathogenesis i have given you the flow chart in the pathogenesis but the important events to describe are the is the destruction of the fibers the uh, uh, movement of the epithelium apical on the root surface the event of the neutrophils crossing the epithelial barrier and third is the root surface changes so these three points have to come in and there is also sometimes a question asked on classification of pockets which carries five marks so if you write all the five classifications you can get up to four four and a half marks in the 10 mark question 
definition is 2 marks, classification is 3 marks and pathogenesis is 5 marks. So that's your breakup. If you are further interested, you are welcome to write down these questions and email it to us and we can correct it and let you know um, where you stand. Right? So thank you for a patient listening and you are welcome to come to me and with any questions at any point of time.